Hi guys, it's Lisa Unger and I am here with my very first episode of Three Good Things in 2021. So welcome, thanks for being here. So I'm always very excited for my guests, as you know, because I only invite people who I love or whose work I love. So I'm always super excited to do this, but Greg Hurwitz is, well, okay, I'll give you like sort of the speech about Greg. See, he's very well behaved because he knows I will go on and on until I go, hi. So he is the New York Times and number one internationally best-selling author of 22 novels. They've been published in 33 languages. And we're here to talk about three good things, but also Prodigal Son, which is the sixth novel in his absolutely stellar Orphan X series and Prodigal Son. Greg, hold it up, hold it up, let's see it. Yay! It's coming out on January 26th, right? That is correct. See, do I get all my facts right? You got it, you got it great. I'm glad we're doing three good things for 2021. I feel like we need that. We, we need to do, we do. Optimism. Right, and that's why I started this at the beginning of 2020 because I thought, well, you know, anytime you turn on your computer, it's a, you know, full scale negative barrage, but, you know, we can kind of hang out and talk about things that are positive and things that we love and that we'll just kind of keep on that program for 2021 as well, because we all still are really needing that positivity. So just a little bit about Greg, who is like one of my besties, seriously. And not only that, but he truly is one of my favorite writers. He's, um, I, I fell in love with his work um, with his 2007 release, The Crime Writer. That was my first Greg Hurwitz book. And ever since then, I've just been in, in love with his work because he just is like, he's just one of these writers that gets everything right every single time. He's a beautiful writer just beautiful prose. He's, you know, a bone deep understanding of his characters. And like all of the books are just completely propulsive. They're just totally action packed. And the Orphan X series really is, you know, one of his best, you know, one of his best characters, Evan Smoke, who is so layered and complicated and just, you know, brilliantly executed. And uh, I enjoy just, you know, every time your new book comes out, I look forward to getting it because I feel like I, I get to read a book that I love and I also get to hang out with my friend, just like this. So now I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> you are actually going to get to talk. Can you believe it? Well, Lisa and I became very close friends because we toured Australia and New Zealand together many That's years right. ago. Well, no, it was just Australia. Just yes. Australia, yeah. But we had a lot of fun and we were we were thrown together. And so it's a lot of it's a lot of bonding when you're on a book tour with somebody. And, so, and I have to, I have to confess, you know, whenever I get your arcs in the mail, it's a happy day in the Hurwitz household also. So the mutual fan club is in full, uh, full swing. Respect. Yeah. So can you just, so unfortunately, because the mail is so completely wonky, I don't have my copy of Prodigal Son yet. I'm waiting. I'm just running to the mailbox every day, like a, like a school girl, like waiting for my crush or whatever, but it's not here. It's coming, but just, can you just tell me a little bit about it? Just like a little teaser for everybody so that we. Sure. So you know. the premise of the Orphan X series is that Evan was taken out, Evan Smoke, my protagonist was taken out of a foster home at the age of 12 and he was trained up to be essentially a disposable weapon in a full black program by the US government, um, where to go places that the US government was not allowed to go, you know, to kill people they weren't allowed to kill, fully expendable, uh, kind of a disposable weapon. Um, but at a certain point, he left the program, his moral compass was kept intact, he was raised by a handler who actually loved him. It was one of the twists or, or differences I wanted to have in the series is it wasn't this horrible traumatic thing because the guy who took him and trained him up to be a sort of contemporary Renaissance man almost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He had to learn languages and etiquette and military history. And, you know, in addition to mixed martial arts fighting, all sorts of things. Told him at one point when he was 12, the hard part isn't making you a killer. The hard part is keeping you human. And so the series is really his quest to, to figure out from this very, um, strict set of rules that he grew up under, the 10 Assassin's Commandments, his path towards breaking some of those commandments and figuring out his humanity. And that was always the arc. 
So he never knew his mother or father. And the end of the last book, he has an encrypted phone now. And when it rings, it's people who are in desperate conditions since he has left the orphan program and he's on the run from the government, but he answers the phone. And if somebody is in a desperate and hopeless situation, they call him and he will help them. And he's got all the skills and resources at his disposal. So he's sort of like a pro bono assassin almost if he deems someone's cause worthy. And the end of the last book, the phone rings and it's a woman who says, Evan, it's your mother. And he never knew his mother. He never thought of it. And so, we, so the book opens with this woman claiming to be Orphan X's mother. And he has to go to investigate and see what happens. And the process of that pulls him all the way back to his past, right? All the way back to the foster home. It's the first time we go to the foster home that he was, that he grew up in. He's got some survivor's guilt, but he also feels some shame of the dirtiness of his upbringing because he's moved so far past that. It's almost like he doesn't want to acknowledge that as part of himself. Mm -hmm. So it's this very personal journey as he tries to figure out, is this woman really his mother? Is it not? And all these clues are dragging him to his past. But at the same time, the current plot is this escalatory um, intrigue that, that, that he realizes slowly reaches up to the higher echelons of power. Mm -hmm. And so the book is sort of, it moves both directions. It moves down and deep to the past as it is sort of exploding upward with, with, a, with a grander and bigger, bigger plot and intrigue that takes him up to some, some very dangerous places. Yeah, and that's that's actually one of the things I love the most about Evan because you know, like you can you can probably point to a hundred different series where you know the main character, the protagonist, is like exactly the same in every single book, and you know maybe the adventure kind of changes around him, or the story is you know different, or you know different elements to the story of what's ha actually happening, but that character just you know kind of persistently remains exactly the same never changes but that is so not true with evan it, he it's such an arc for his character over over the books and we really do book by book get to know more about him you know even as he's kind of discovering more about himself like the layers of himself that like you know he buries or he rejects or whatever like he's always being asked to face some new layer of himself and I know that, you know, you, I, I have a very like sort of deep relationship with my characters. Like I feel like very just connected to them and like sort of on, you know, um, just inside their journey. Like is it, what is your relationship to Evan and how do you feel like it has changed over the course of the book? You know, it's so interesting. I feel like with books, a lot of times for me, I would only figure out what a book was about a year or two after. Yeah, exactly. I back and exactly. It clear as day, right? You look back and go, oh, clearly. Oh, right. A book called Your Next that was like clearly about my, oh, yeah. you know, sense of vulnerability becoming a parent, right? Absolutely. And it's just clear as day in the book, but it never even occurred to me. I just was thinking about the plot. And so it's interesting with Orphan X is in a lot of ways, I wrote the first one when I was on the cusp of 40 which for me was kind of a, you know, a milestone in my consideration. And it's what the series is really about is Evan starting to learn that the, that the, the more rigid rules and ideologies that bound him have to be broken apart for him to emerge more fully as a person. And so right. it's really, it's really prefigured in a lot of ways, the things that, that I'm going through. And so as I continue to kind of learn and expand and figure out the ways that I want to be in the world, he's almost one step ahead of me in some ways. Mm -hmm. in other ways, like I'm doing something in my own life, which I'll loop back in with him. And so it's, it's, it's far and away the most intimate relationship I've had with the character. There's just so much. Yeah, I can definitely feel that for sure. Just in the, just watching him evolve on the page. You know, so I'm very excited for the new book, Prodigal Son, which mm -hmm. comes out on January 26th. And, you know, I mean, everybody's read Greg Hurwitz, right? There isn't anybody who doesn't know Greg, but you know, if you don't, today's the day. You, you must read everything he's ever written because he's amazing. Um, so we're both, you know, both of us are lifelong writers, right? It's, it's been a, a term, like a passion um, for, for both of us since we were kids, right? I mean, you, you two and, and your education is, is, is very literature focused. Um, what is there anything right now? Um, you know, my point in saying that is like, you know, we're all all writers are readers first. Like that's where we fall in love with story and the pages of somebody else's book. And I'm just wondering for you right now, is there something, is there a book that is like, you know, something that you return to again and again for comfort? 
or something that's just really transporting you right now or whatever is just one book right now that's really, you know, um, important for you. It's so funny you were having this conversation because I went back. So I did much like you started this to give people something to do and, and, and like a, to have a, a point of light in the pandemic, let's just say, right? Because all these tenors in Italy are like singing off their balconies, right? right. <laughs> and so we're trying to figure out some way to engage with readers and to try and, you know, liven people up with a dose of normal joy in a way that's celebratory. So I did, I did two episodes of what I call the quarantine book club, where I paired a book with a, with a beverage, because as you know, I like. Oh, I love that. And so the first one I did was The Great Gatsby. Oh, yeah. Which was my favorite. No, it was the second one. The first one I did, Crime and Punishment. Okay. The Great Gatsby for me was a book that I read every single year. And so I went back to it and, and it's on my, there's like a Facebook page for it and people can see, I do like an hour kind of book club sort of talk about it. And what was amazing for me is that book, I used to read that book every year. And so I, but I hadn't returned to it in maybe 15 years, 20 years now. And when I read it, it had the exact opposite meaning that it held for me when I was growing up. I mean, 180 degrees opposite. Yeah. And it was the most amazing experience, you know, and that's part of why I was thinking about, you know, we often read the classics when we're at an age where we're in some ways too young to grasp them in full. Yes. And so I'm trying to kind of go back and forge more. I'm reading Nabokov now again, Laughter in the Dark, which I hadn't read yet. Mm -hmm. But um, the Great Gatsby, when I was young, I thought he was so romantic and the striving and the betterment of himself and like doing right. everything for love and trying to recreate the past and the relationship with Daisy Buchanan. I was so swept up with his self-improvement and his building of himself as a sort of fictional icon, really, his own creation. And it's so funny because going back and reading it after being married and having kids and being ostensibly an adult, I was struck so much by the hollowness of that romantic vision. It was, it was like being on the exact opposite side of it to see how, how little equipped he, he was to engage with reality in any way. And so I used to think he was like too pure to live in the real world, which is why, you know, he meets the fate that he does. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting for me to return to it and have it kind of crashing against the shoals of, of reality and to realize like the hollowness in the in his inability to to recognize what intimacy is right to recognize what reality is and to adapt to it and right. so it was really something else because i've probably read that book more than any other one and i returned to it for a sense of kind of comfort and instead it, it took apart a lot of my um presuppositions and some of the ones upon which i realized i based parts of my life and books will do that yeah, well, they they will for for some of us. Yeah, that that's so interesting. And there are a number of books like that for me that I you know I have gone back to again and again over the years, and just like sometimes just as as touchstones and or, or you know just to read them again because I'm just so in love with the story and just shocked that every time I go back it's a different book. Like 100 Years of Solitude is like that for me. Every time I go back there it's a different book, you know. And every like Jane Eyre is another one you know, um, and even, you know, even like a in cold blood, every time I pick that book up and, and read it again, if there's a new layer, there's something else I didn't understand, or the more I learn about Truman Capote, or what I understand more about that, you know, that investigation in that time, and, and who he was as a person, like there's all the stuff that you read when you're a kid, you know, you take away these, you know, these kind of like golden tidbits from it, and then you know, later when you go back, some, you know, there's gold there that you never mind. And some of the things that you thought were gold or ash. And it's yes, such a, yes. it's such That's a, well, like, it's well such said. a moving, it's such a moving experience every time you go back to these, especially if you've had like this lifelong love affair with books and, and story, you know, like that's really, you know, that's such, like such a, such a gift and also such a journey to, to return to those, to those books. Yeah. I, it's funny with, with Crime and Punishment too, it was, there's that humbling experience because I was reading that when we were in the thick of polarization and political discussion here yeah. and reading it, you're like, oh, nothing, nothing's new. It's so, <laughs> it's all, it's so much of the same sort of struggles that he's writing about and the same cultural stuff. And it, it's sort of comforting and humbling at the same time. Yeah, yeah, like Ocean's reading, uh, my daughter Ocean is, uh, she's 15 and she just read um, uh, Fahrenheit 451, 
which we that which um we jeff and i wound up rereading again uh just a couple years ago i can't even remember why but then just like looking at it again with her you know with her and like just kind of talking to her about it and like it's like it, I mean, it's, it's exactly the same as like everything that, you know, we're facing right now. It just, you know, it's just, it's simpler and like maybe more um, like crystallized in this like very, uh, you know, very interesting way, but it's so relevant to everything that, that we're experiencing right now. And it's just, a, it's just kind of an interest. It's a, it is comforting in a way, you know, cause you think, Oh, well, <laughs> maybe it's not so bad, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe 50 years from now or 60 years from now, but like, oh, they were so naive. We are, yeah, we are, it's part, that's part of the thing is that that's what stories do, you know, I always think about now, you know, like when people are getting married, you know, when your right. first friends are getting married from college, it's like, they're the first people who've ever been married. <laughs> when you have a kid, you feel like you're the first, it's it's all, right. It's and so it, it there's it's such an interesting thing with stories when you just recognize these universal themes yeah. and you know we we fit into them and it knocks some of the chronic uniqueness off off our corners of our ego. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's so interesting. Um, yeah, and so you know, and I think that you know we do have this kind of love affair with story. Um, you you know it. it it crosses medium, right? You know, most of us who are readers are also great lovers of film and television and theater and all of that. So, and, and most of us are doing way more television viewing right now. I know like last year when I was talking to a lot of my author pals, they were like, I just can't even read right now. And so like, I don't have the bandwidth to like mm -hmm. read. And, but they, you know, they could definitely find the bandwidth to watch, you know, watch certain things on Netflix or whatever. And so I'm just wondering, is there anything that you're watching right now that really has transported you? Or conversely, is there something like the ocean and I like go back and watch the same thing like over and over again, like just for comfort? Is there anything um, for, like that for you? Watch over and over again. Give me a couple. Okay. Um, like, well, most, recent, most recently, um, I'm just going to Eurovision. Have you, have you seen it? You haven't. <laughs> Eurovision. Eurovision with Will Ferrell. Oh, there's oh. Jack. Jack. Hello. Eurovision. Okay, got it. Oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> he's he's okay. So Eurovision. Have you not seen it? Will you please watch it like tonight with okay. your family? Please. I'll make a note. Well, you'll email me when we're off, and then yeah, I will. Uh, Moana. Um, okay. we'll, we'll, watch, <laughs> we'll watch Moana again and again. Um, Hamilton. Like now that it's on Disney Plus. We just, whenever we, and the same thing with the soundtracks, we just like, whenever we really need that, like whatever it is that like, that you get from Hamilton and Moana. And Moana. Um, yeah, I could, I could go on and listen. We watch Stranger Things. We'll go back and watch Stranger Things, Parks and Rec, you know, mm -hmm. just because like, there's just something that there's like an energy to it. That's like comforting. So that, that's kind of what Jeff is like, not, he will not rewatch. I personally will rewatch The Crown Oh, I just, I'm For just, any reason. Season, it's, it is, that is so spectacular. It is so brilliant. I, yeah, I keep thinking, you know, how easy is his job? All he has to do is write 10 Oscar worthy scripts a year. Right, exactly. They're staggering. Every single it's episode. So staggeringly good. It's perfection. Experience. So, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you something. So for me, you know, part of the pandemic and, and the, the, the sort of political haze of the last year. Yeah also had me feeling slightly um, lethargic around yeah. entertainment. And, and one of the things that really reinvigorated me was the Queen's Gambit. Yeah. Um, it just so, me up. I, now and then you feel like there's a story that's written specifically for you, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I completely, I was captivated by the story. I loved, I loved every last thing about it. I loved how, um, her toughness. I loved her. She was, she's such an interesting actress. You can just watch her, how yeah. her face works, yeah. her expressions, the yeah. subtlety, the casting in it was spectacular. The issues of her strength uh, and her, her strength in her femininity, mm -hmm. but then it was also met with really, there was really strong men surrounding her who had their own genius and flaws right. and imperfection and boundaries and strengths and how they all drew from each other. But I, I love primarily it was about the cost of genius, right? There's no free lunch. And so the ways that her, that she had to um, 
figure out how to live with her gift while walking a tightrope between sanity and insanity. Um, yeah. I just thought it was spectacular. And so it's Fun. the second, it's the only, so usually if I, there's so many things to read and see that if I see a movie, let's say, or, or a TV show of a book, I don't go back and read it unless I've read the book before I've seen it. Mm -hmm. This was the second time I went back and read the book, The Temis. Uh -huh. And it's an incredible book. And is it? I'm fortunate enough that Scott, Scott Frank is a, is a, I could, a friend slash acquaintance of mine. And I had a conversation with him about the books. I, he's just so incredible, the adaptation. And we had this conversation about the ways that he, you know, drew elements from the book. It's, it's incredible. It's this little book and you could read it, you'd read it in a night. Mm. And it feels like everything in the mini series grew organically from that book. That's amazing. Um, it's amazing how much of the miniseries is in the book and how much isn't because the adaptation is so artful that mm. everything grew organically out of it. He just completely captured it properly. The other one I went back and read was after I saw Winter's Bone. Oh yeah, I have not read that, but I have always wanted to. It's Woodrell's incredible. Yeah. And, so, and it's another, like the movie was just amazing. And I just thought, how, how did this get rendered right mm. in front? So, and so part of it for me, I have a really fond part of for myself because watching that, I felt that reinvigoration of engagement with the story that for a lot, like I went back, I, I'm not a chess player. I went back, I was, I was looking up the chess players. I was researching yeah. or Morphe a little bit. I had a conversation with Scott about the adaptation. It really like lit that, um, that edge where you feel really alive and engaged. And so it has a very special place in my heart at the end of what was a pretty long year. Yeah, well, I mean, and you, I mean, that's also kind of the way your mind works. You've written so many brilliant um, screenplays. Have you ever adapted a, a book to film, not your own? Yes, not, I, they haven't been produced. I've adapted Stephen King. I've adapted my own stuff. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've run the whole range. I've done yeah. For TV film all the way around. Did that like, did it inspire you to like find a book that, you know, would ignite that like sort of other layer of your creativity, like a book that would inspire you to write the screenplay? Did it inspire you in that way? You know what's so weird? It wasn't as much that as I was so, I was so interested in the craft of it. Like yeah. I didn't get past it to myself and my own right. writing. I was just right. so engaged with it psychologically. And like the perfection around chess. And of course, Scott Frank did, right? Scott Frank did a walk among the tombstones. It's a Lawrence block. He's adapted Elmore Leonard, right? He's done, like you go down the list and he's he's just incredible with with thrillers and crime fiction. But of course, Queen's Gambit is a thriller, right? right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a series of battles that take yeah, place. Yeah, absolutely. It's intrigues, it's, yeah. you know. And so he shot it like that also. And I just I just went all the way down the rabbit hole. Yeah, with, you that's know, so I love that. Um, I also love, so, sorry, so no, go. To go back. So with Winter's Bone too, I mean, one of the things I love, and that's with Jennifer Lawrence, the movie, mm -hmm. the thing I love that the two women at the center of these stories, the female protagonists is they're not just sort of strong women. They're, right. they're complicated. Cause right. I, I, I tire of sort of the strong woman trope where, Absolutely. you know, they're sort of, um, you know, just sort of saints and they always have the quick answer and they were there there's there's they're allowed to breathe in both of these stories the right. books and the adaptations they're allowed to have complexities they're allowed to have flaws they're allowed to 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 be fully human absolutely uh, and that to me was so it's so intriguing it's so engaging when somebody dives into all that complexity that way yeah, and I, this is a conversation that I, I know that you and I have had and that Ace Atkins and I have had more recently that, you know, it's the it's the flaws of our characters that that make them who they are and that, you know, that that we relate to as writers and that our, our readers relate to. I mean, it's what makes people human, what's broken. That's what that's what people, um, you know, gravitate towards. It's not like you know, the strong, you know, like the strong woman or like, you know, the hero or whatever, like that's okay in some sense, but it's very flat. And certainly there's nothing in life that replicates that. So we're always looking for that flaw, you know, for that flawed character. And that's the, you know, that's the place where we, that's the place where we connect. I, I mean, for me, especially as, as a writer, like, 
you know, like I'm always, you know, like I always kind of consider myself a spelunker, you know, like I'm like shimmying my way into like the dark spaces of the human psyche. And um, because that's where all the, that's where all the good stuff is. <laughs> that's where all the real and interesting stuff is. The, the crack is the place where the light enters. Absolutely. Um, and um, so I'm sad because I don't know that you and I have sat across from each other at a table and had a drink or a meal in a long time. And that is one of our favorite things to do together because we're both huge foodies. And I know you're um, you're basically like a mixologist, right? Don't you have like your own bar or something now that you want to talk about? Well, it's one of the fun things with writing Orphan Access, you drink the world's, only the world's finest vodka. That's Even right. <laughs> <laughs> I gravitate towards the browns, right? I love scotch. I love whiskey. I love bourbon. Scotch right. But for him, the, the sort of distillation process of vodka is the purest spirit, right? And it yes. sort of mirrors his upbringing. It's like a purification ceremony for him in some ways. Mm -hmm. So what's great is I get all these vodkas. If I write about vodka, you know, they get a lot of exposure, their sales go up. And so I, I get these amazing vodkas that distillers mm -hmm. sent me from around the world, which has been, which has been great. But for my cocktail, you know, I'm going to do a cocktail, right? For my I favorite. know, of course you're going to do a cocktail. I would have expected Here's, this one has a bit of a backstory. So okay. my longest standing publisher is my Dutch publisher. His name is Stephen Moss. Wonderful, wonderful guy. And I've been with him forever, right? So I switch publishers. Um, you know, my second longest standing is, is, is in the US, but he goes all the way back to like my, gosh, fifth book, I want to say, fourth <laughs> book. Um, and when I went over there to tour in Amsterdam, um, one of the things that I never knew is that gin is not British. We associated so much with Britain. Gin origi originated in Holland. Mm -hmm. And so they have the big binders of gins with all the different tonics, with all the different, right? It's a, there's all sorts of different combinations. And so when I was there, you know, I made it as a goal to drink as much, as many gins and gin and tonics as were humanly possible. <laughs> My I'm so proud of you. You always meet your goals. That's right. <laughs> and so part of, so there's a gin called Bobby's Gin and it's Dutch and it has all these Indonesian spices like cardamom. It's got this mm. whole edge. And if you get fever tree, elderflower flavored tonic, okay, that's step number two. So it's a little bit sweet that cuts the, the Indonesian spice that underlies the gin. And then you do it with a slice of orange. And for me, when I make it, you put it on the rocks and I pour both the gin and the tonic through the, the half piece of orange so that the orange acts almost as a filter oh and you stir it. And it is, it's, it's a transcendent gin and tonic. It's the best gin and tonic I, that I've had. I call, I think it's the best gin and tonic in the world. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. There's another, another fun fact. <laughs> So with Steven, you know, like I said, we go back a ways, but when I came back, I said, look, we signed a new deal. I said, for every new deal I sign, you have to send me a bottle of Bobby's gin. And so it was really funny. So to this day, like I just did a two book deal. It's like, send me two bottles of, of gin. And yeah. show them. But you can now get it in the US. It's called Bobby's gin. Okay. I'm on this. this Beaver is tree, like Beaver tree elder it. flower tonic and a slice of orange. And okay. I want everybody, everybody find me on Twitter or my website or Facebook or Instagram or wherever the hell I am and yeah. tell me what you think of that. And tell me if that's not the best gin and tonic you've ever had in your life. I, I, I'm super excited. We are totally, we are totally going to make that this weekend for sure. For sure. So, um, speaking of all your various platforms, um, are you, uh, going to be doing a virtual tour for your book? I am indeed. I'm doing an event at Diesel Books. I'm doing Murder by the Books, which is one of our favorites. We've oh, yes. Yes. To meet there and do an event there. I'm doing the Poison Pen. So yeah, I have, I have a bunch of events. You can find them on gregherwitz.net or Twitter or any of the places that I am. Um, I have them listed. I'm going to bring in, I've been bringing in some of my experts to talk. I brought in my a guns and material expert. I had a conversation. Oh, that's with smart. I love that. And I'm going to bring in a, uh, someone I did mixed martial arts and mindful awareness training with same that's guy, cool. which is interesting. And then my medical expert. Um, oh, that's a, super interesting, Greg. I love that. That's a great idea to have yeah, all your yeah. research points and to do the interviews with you. That's, that's fantastic. I love that. 
Yeah, and my 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 diesel event. I want to say my first event is going to be sponsored by um, Aero Vodka. That's the first. Uh, they they pull like carbon monoxide. They're the first zero emissions uh, spirit in the world, um, and everything is like they they make it. You know, pulling carbon dioxide from the air. It's a really good beverage, and it's funny because by the time they reached out to me, and I'd already written them into the next manuscript, which is funny. By the time the vodka company had reached me. Oh, so it was a funny. funny overlap. That's happened a few times that a distiller has reached out and then like a, a month later, the book comes out and they're in it. And they're like, how did you do that? Because I'm always <laughs> on the search for, for the right vodkas that match whatever Evan's contending with in the moment. That's perfect. I love that. Well, it's it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. I know that everybody is going to love tuning in for um, Greg's events. And I'm, I'm sure like at Diesel, are you going to actually go into the store and sign and sign the books? So there'll be like a, a like a stock of sign books at Diesel. There will indeed. Yeah, we'll have um, sign editions everywhere. Okay, perfect. And also probably Poison Pen and Murder by the Book the sign first editions will be available at all those stores. So that's important because like, you know, if you do tune in to um, some of Greg's events at some of these really significant uh, independent stores across the country, there it's very important that when you do tune into that event that you buy your book from that store because they go through so much work for us. They do so much to set up these events, especially now. In this age of Zoom, there's like a whole technological piece that wasn't there before. And um, so many more people are able to come to our events now because, you know, we're not limited by, you know, time and distance and all of that and in the ways that we were. So if you do tune in um, to any of Greg's events, please make sure you get a signed copy from the, the store that you visit. Greg, thank you for being here with me. Um, very soon, we're going to have dinner together somewhere, right? Absolutely. On, and, on one uh, coast or the other. It's always yeah, great to see you, Lisa. Exactly. Great to see you and uh, congratulations on Prodigal Son. Can't wait to get my copy. Thank you.